My name is Shian Armagani. I'm one of the orthopedic spine surgeons at the Florida Orthopedic Institute. My main practice is out of our Citrus Park location, which is off of Gun Highway in Carrollwood. Additionally, I see patients at our main campus at our telecom clinic. However, we have over 10 locations throughout the Tampa Bay area, all of which provide some sort of spine care. And at each of the 10 locations, we do have access to every orthopedic surgery subspecialty. Today, I'll be talking about the diagnosis and treatment of lumbar spine conditions. Our objectives today are gonna to be to identify and diagnose common spine conditions of the lumbar spine, look at the conservative treatment options for those conditions, when to refer to a specialist, and also talk briefly about possible surgical interventions. But first, we'll talk a little bit about how this may affect you or your patients. And that is low back pain is one of the most widely experienced health problems in the world. Eight out of 10 people will have back pain at some point in their life. And next to the common cold, it is the main reason for missed work and physician visits. It is estimated that the costs of low back pain range somewhere between 30 and $70 billion every year. So how do we like to think about uh, lumbar spine conditions? Well, there are patients who have just back pain. There are patients who may have just leg pain. And then there's where the majority of our patients are, and that is they have some sort of breakdown between leg pain and back pain, whether it be 90% leg pain and 10% back or a 50-50 split. So let's think about the common conditions that we can uh, find that cause leg pain by itself, leg pain and back pain, as well as just back pain, okay? So things that can cause both leg pain and back pain commonly are disc herniations, spinal stenosis, which is a compression of the, of the nerves within the lumbar spine, and also something called spondylolisthesis, which is a bony issue and has to do with the bones that make up the spinal column are moving inappropriately, causing compression of the spinal nerves within the lumbar spine. But then there are the things that can cause just low back pain, and that can be degenerative disc disease, deformities, scoliosis, kyphosis, all basically big words for different anatomy uh, of what it would look like in your spine. But then we have the dreaded black box, and this is what goes into the majority of patients who have just low back pain, and that is a not identifiable cause for why patients may have a specific complaint with regards to their back. So, Low back pain is one of the most frequently encountered conditions within a clinical practice. And up to 84% of adults have low back pain at some time in their lives. And over one quarter of US adults do report recent low back pain. It has a high direct and indirect cost and is a common reason for missed work. When we talk about direct cost, that has to do with treating just the patient in and of themselves. So that could be the physical therapy that they require, the medication they require. But indirect costs have to do with maybe the patient's uh, uh, family member has to take time off of work to help take care of them, and that would be an indirect cost uh, for, um, that goes into low back pain. And for a lot of our patients, they may not be able to take care of themselves when they have one of these episodes happen. So what's the natural history of low back pain? The prognosis for acute, non-radicular low back pain is generally, generally favorable. When I say non-radicular, it means that you don't experience any sciatica. Uh, no symptoms kind of shoot down the leg or anything like that. Uh, studies have shown that improvements in pain meaning a reduction of about 50% uh, or greater of their initial pain scores occurs within one month. So you can interpret that in a way of saying that if a patient comes in with back pain, it just started, they came into your clinic because they hurt something a few days ago, their pain is gonna get, be cut in half generally by the end of about one month. So time is of the essence with this and it will get better with time. But there are some patients with persistent symptoms 
and can, and, but continued improvements are often seen in the subacute phase between the four and 12 week mark. So even if a patient's not completely better after one month, they can still see some incremental improvements up to three months. In a minority of patients though, non-radicular low back pain that lasts longer than 12 weeks, at that point we would then consider them to be having what we call chronic low back pain. But patients with chronic back pain account for the bulk of the burden and the cost of low back pain just because of the duration of how long it's been going on. And also at that point, you're starting to get into some other um, modalities that can be used to try to help treat their pain. If a patient comes in after about a week or so of back pain, you may just give them a little bit of anti-inflammatories, but if they're consistently coming in, they've had pain for three months, they're probably getting some physical therapy, they're getting some other uh, different modalities to try to help treat their discomfort. Predictors for chronicity are related to various psychosocial factors, the presence of non-organic signs or symptoms, a high baseline functional impairment, and low general health status. So if a patient comes in and they're not as healthy as you would, uh, as you would imagine, um, they may struggle with uh, uncontrolled diabetes, they may struggle with obesity, uh, they may be on a lot of other uh, um, medications at home that make it very difficult for them to be active. These are probably the patients, if they come in with low back pain initially, that may progress to the chronic state. So how do we treat low back pain? Well, for patients almost with exclusively low back pain, the mainstay of treatment is going to be non-operative. In acute low back pain, the passage of time is of the most consistent and reliable treatment. And the majority, greater than 75% of patients, will return to their baseline function within about three months. Pharmacologic management. How, how should we treat these patients medication-wise? Well, Non-steroidals are gonna be the workhorse uh, for patients, whether that be an ibuprofen or a prescription strength uh, anti-inflammatory. Opiates and muscle relaxers uh, could be used in conjunction with NSAIDs. However, they're no different than placebo in patients with acute non-radicular low back pain. So in my practice, with patients with just back pain that happen acutely, they are almost never getting uh, opiates or muscle relaxers as opposed to a course of anti-inflammatories because there's no difference in their um, outcomes. Corticosteroids are no different also than placebo in patients with non-radicular pain as well. So giving a steroid dose pack may not help these patients if they have just back pain. However, patients with chronic greater than three months of low back pain should still avoid opiates unless referred to a pain management uh, physician who can try to give them a short course of treatment of opiates and then quickly try to wean them down in a safe way so that there isn't a, uh, a potential for dependency. Physical therapy here is the key to remaining active uh, through the pain to prevent stiffness. So moving around is gonna be the best thing for these patients despite the pain. <clears throat> active modalities are more efficacious than passive modalities, meaning things that the patients are doing on their own. So if you're showing them stretches or their therapist is showing them stretches or strengthening exercises for their core, if the patient is able to complete those on their own, that does do better than things that are done to the patient by somebody else. For example, uh, massage, ultrasound, um, uh, acupuncture, chiropractic care, those sorts of things. Now, that's not to say that the passive modalities do not help patients. They do help patients uh, to some degree. But on the whole, when you look at thousands and thousands of patients, things that are done actively are more likely to help the patient get back to their baseline than passive modalities. So I typically like to start with a home exercise program in the acute phase, and if symptoms persist for over four to six weeks, then I'll consider a, a more formal physical therapy. Also, if the patient may be unable to perform a ho home exercise program, either uh, secondary to pain or their general health state, it may be a good idea to try to get them some sort of physical therapy, either as an outpatient or at home. So uh, when I'm trying to evaluate these patients, I like to consider an x-ray first 
and then an MRI only if symptoms persist to rule out a treatable diagnosis that may be presenting as back pain, and which we'll get into a little bit um, later on. And if you remember back, there are some diagnoses that can cause back pain that are treatable causes. So I like to avoid advanced imaging in the acute phase if there are no red flag symptoms. And red flag symptoms to me are radicular leg pain or shooting pain or discomfort down the legs, or if a patient is having some problems with bowel or bladder incontinence that is new. In that case, that is an emergency and should be uh, evaluated quickly with an MRI or in the ER. So going back, to our, um, going back to our graph, we'll look here about the causes of uh, leg and back pain. So right now we'll focus on disc herniations. Uh, so the common surgical spine conditions that we're going to go over for the lumbar spine will involve disc herniations, spinal stenosis, and spondylolisthesis. So we'll go a little bit more in depth to talk about these very common causes of uh, back and leg pain. So a disc herniation, one of the more uh, common things that you'll see, also described as a slip disc in, uh, uh, in layman's terms, um, but a herniated disc is a painful back condition that occurs when some of the disc material in the backbone pops out of place and bulges into the spinal canal, creating pressure upon, um, upon the spinal nerves and pain that typically goes all the way down the leg. Uh, one important thing to note is in the lumbar spine, there is no spinal cord. Uh, that's one very important thing to know. Uh, in the lumbar spine or in the low back, all that you see down there is just a collection of nerve rootlets. So there's no um, uh, serious concern for uh, potential paralysis from a very small disc herniation. But these disc herniations and uh, uh, disc bulges and bone spurs can press upon uh, the sac that holds these nerves and can cause a lot of discomfort and pain. So uh, for example here, this is kind of a cross-section, so we're looking at a patient or a, or a um, model from the side. And so if you imagine over here, this is where kind of the abdomen would be. And over here is the uh, skin of the uh, back of the patient. And so this square here is the vertebral body, and down here is another vertebral body. But between each of those bones that make up the spinal column is the cushion between the spine, excuse me, between the uh, uh, vertebral bodies. And that's what's called the disc. Now, the disc usually is normally uh, very plump and uh, provides a good amount of cushion, but sometimes the disc can degenerate over time and part of that disc material can go backwards into where the spinal canal is and push on nerves. The way I like to describe a disc herniation is to think of it almost like a jelly donut. Uh, if you take a small bite out of a jelly donut and you uh, kind of press it between your hands, some of that jelly is going to come out. And that jelly is basically part of the disc. And that is the thing that can cause significant issues uh, for patients if it's pressing upon a nerve. So what's the history of this? Well, basically it can present with symptoms of low back pain but also radicular pain, and this involves pain that can go into the buttock or into the leg. It can also involve pain in both legs as well. This is generally worse with sitting and it does improve with standing. Symptoms are worsened, worsened by uh, coughing, uh, straining, or sneezing. And then there's the dangerous thing, which is called cauda equina syndrome, which is present in under 10% of uh, patients with this condition, and that's when the disc herniation is so large, it compresses most of the spinal nerves that are down in the lumbar spine and can cause serious problems with weakness, bowel and bladder incontinence that can potentially be irreversible. So these are one of the emergent diagnoses that a spine surgeon uh, would look for. But for physical exam, we look for a straight leg raise sign, and this is the way I like to do this examination is I like to have the patient sit on the exam table, and I just try to tell them to extend their leg um, up like they're trying to kick their leg out. And generally, if they are going to have pain, they'll say the pain is going down their leg as they're stretching their um, leg out. And the reason why is because the nerve that's being displaced by that disc herniation or bone spurs is getting kind of tethered across the 
um, protrusion or the disc and that's what causes the mechanical pain that they experience. So this is one of the most important and predictive physical findings for identifying who's a good candidate for surgery. So if someone comes in, they've had six weeks of pain shooting down their leg, you sit them down, they start having increased pain with sitting, you straighten out their leg, they have, it reproduces their symptoms almost, uh, almost perfectly. That's probably a good patient if they fail conservative measures that would do well with an operation. Additionally, we have something called a contralateral straight leg raise where you tell them to straighten the leg that doesn't hurt them. And if that happens, it kind of lets the surgeon know that the disc herniation may be, um, may be in a different location than where it usually is. But it is less sensitive, but it is more specific for a disc herniation. Also, you want to examine them for any extremity weakness, weakness in their foot, quadricep muscle, uh, uh, gastroc, those sorts of things. So what's our treatment? The great news is, is that 75 to 90 percent of patients with disc herniations will improve with conservative measures. These measures involve physical therapy, anti-inflammatories, and possibly epidural steroid injections if needed. But I would consider surgery for failure of conservative treatment for at least six weeks. And in these cases, you can do a small, microscopic, minimally invasive surgery that all of our spine surgeons at the Florida Orthopedic Institute are well trained and versed in. Spinal stenosis. This is the next sort of um, condition that can cause back and leg symptoms. But while disc herniations, typically those are happen more in a younger population, those uh, younger than 50, those patients in their 50s, 40s, and 30s, and even in their 20s. Spinal stenosis is generally a symptom that happens more gradually over time and may be seen more in our retirees. So if you want to think about it one way, the spinal canal runs through the vertebrae and contains the nerves that supply sensation and strength to the legs. Between the vertebrae are the discs that we talked about, as well as the joints that allow them to move back and forth. But as people age, there can be a little bit of drying up of these discs that we like to call disc degeneration. And the space between the vertebral bodies shrinks. Now, just kind of like we were talking about our jelly donut um, analogy earlier, as the, as the um, jelly is pulled out of that, of that donut, it may flatten out a little bit. And just like you flatten a donut with your hands, it expands in all directions. One of those ways that it may expand is into the spinal canal and could potentially cause compression upon your nerves. So um, one way to look at it is this, and this is a normal spine, okay? This is again to orient you, this is as if you're laying down. So your back would be right here and your uh, uh, stomach and stuff would be kind of right here. This bone that looks like a Y, that's the bone that if you touched your back, that's the bone that you're going to feel. The disc sits in front of where the spine is, and in here is the spinal canal. You can see that there's a lot of white space around for the, uh, for the, spine, uh, for the spine and the nerves. But if you look at someone with spinal stenosis, you see that there's a lot less space for the um, spinal canal, which causes less space for the nerves. So again, Spinal stenosis, big word, all it means is less space for the nerves within the canal. So what's the history for this? They actually have a pretty consistent diagnosis, or excuse me, persistent signs and symptoms. And that's something that we call neurogenic claudication. This is basically burning pain in the legs that occurs with standing and walking for periods of time. But this pain is alleviated by sitting down or laying down. This is one thing that you can distinguish from vascular claudication, and this is what happens when standing worsens the symptoms in patients who have spinal stenosis. Uh, and again, if you put a patient on a stationary bike, it does not cause their uh, pain and discomfort if they have spinal stenosis. <clears throat> so on physical exam, you look for lower extremity weakness, lower extremity sensory changes, but this is largely a historical and an image-guided diagnosis. This is the patient that comes in and says, you know, doc, I got a lot of uh, burning pain that goes down the back of my legs and on the side of my legs, 
but it really only happens when I go walk around the block or I go to the grocery store. Uh, but when I go to the grocery store, I like to kind of lean over the cart and I feel a little bit better. Or they may say, I walk around for 10 minutes and then I have to sit down and take a break on a bench, but then I'm able to get back up because the pain goes away. This is very consistently looked at as a sign or symptom of spinal stenosis. So what's our treatment for this? Well, generally, unfortunately, it doesn't get much better, but conservative measures can help with the pain, including, again, physical therapy, anti-inflammatories, and possibly epidural steroid injections. However, these have been shown to be less efficacious than for epidural steroid injections for disc herniations. The reason why has to do with the chronicity or how long the um, offending uh, agent has been around. So a disc herniation generally is not there and then it's there. And so there's a large inflammatory reaction which can really be quieted down with an epidural steroid injection. However, for most patients with spinal stenosis, this has been a slow going thing for many, many months and there isn't as much inflammation going on that would get um, improved with an epidural steroid injection. So generally I consider surgery for failure of conservative treatment for at least three months and this can involve a laminectomy uh, with or without fusion. So one way that I like to describe surgery for patients with spinal stenosis is something that I picked up back uh, when I was training is the best way to kind of think about how the spine is is just to kind of think about it like a house. So the roof of the house is the bone that you can feel when you're touching your back and inside of the house lives where the nerves are. Now some people over time they may have a small house to begin with and so that can cause a lot of compression of the nerves if they start having some disc degeneration. Unfortunately, we just can't make you a new house. We can't turn you from this into this. But what we can do is create more room for the spine. And the way we would do that is just to kind of take the roof off of the, of the, uh, of the house, creating much more room for the spine and the nerves. And that basically is what a laminectomy is. Now, when we talk about fusion, that has more to do if the bones are moving inappropriately or in the process of removing the roof of the house, you have to remove so much bone that you may cause instability or abnormal motion between the bones. And so in that case, it would require rods and screws being placed uh, to, stabilize, to stabilize the bones. Spondylolisthesis. This is a condition in which the vertebrae in the spine slip forward out of alignment and is caused by degeneration of both the disc and the joints uh, that hold the bones together, which allow for the vertebrae to move out, in and out of place. So when you look at the uh, spine here, generally this is again looking at it from the side, all these bones that make up the spinal column or the vertebrae need to, are generally lined up perfectly. However, there may be a bone that is slipped forward up to a centimeter sometimes or even more on the bone below it. And what that does is it causes a significant amount of compression for the nerves as they're going out of the, um, out of the dura and then down the legs. So what's the history for this? <clears throat> Generally it's back pain is the most common presenting symptom, but it's usually rel relieved with rest and sitting. Neurogenic claudication and leg pain are the second most common symptoms. Again, if you remember for spinal stenosis, what was the cause of spinal stenosis there? There wasn't much room for the, for the nerves of the spine. But if you think about spondylolisthesis, if you have the bone moving forward or slipping forward inappropriately, you're also causing decreased space for the canal or decreased canal space, thus decreased space for the nerves too. So that can actually even cause spinal stenosis type symptoms, but just caused by a different thing. Instead of just normal disc degeneration or bone spurs causing the compression of the nerves, it's actually the bone being slipped forward. Spondylolisthesis is something that you can see in all ages though. So again, neurogenic claudication is relieved by sitting. Uh, it could be one-sided, it could be one down one leg, could be down both legs. And it's the same symptoms that is found with spinal stenosis. 
But on physical exam, it's similar than it's similar to what you would see with spinal stenosis. You rely on looking at um, pain, where their pain is, weakness uh, within their muscles, decreases in sensation or reflexes. But again, mostly this is a historical and an image-guided diagnosis. So the treatment for this is you can see improvements in, with conservative measures, like everything within spine. Physical therapy, non steroidals, and again, epidural steroid injections may live somewhere in between disc herniations and normal spinal stenosis in its efficacy. But you want to consider surgery for those who fail conservative measures for six months. And the reason why you like to wait sometimes for six months is because a large majority of these people may end up requiring a fusion surgery. Now, you can treat spondylolisthesis um, with just a laminectomy procedure, if you remember, just taking the roof off. But sometimes you have to add the screws and rods in if the bones are physically moving inappropriately with each other. Sometimes if you get into our, our retiree population, the bones are slipped forward, but they're not moving inappropriately. They may just be standing, uh, they may just be staying in the same place due to arthritis and such. So in those limited cases, you may be able to get away with just doing a laminectomy, but the literature is still a little bit controversial in that. But that's another reason why coming to a surgeon at the Florida Orthopedic Institute is a little bit of a benefit for you because we are up to date on all of the newest literature. We're involved in uh, trials uh, looking at these uh, different uh, different diagnoses and we can give you the best uh, uh, information to make a decision. Looking at, speaking about research, some of the best research that's been done within spine has been called the SPORT trial and it's something that is very easily uh, looked upon. Um, if you Google it, you're able to read all the nitty-gritty you want about uh, these conditions. But it stood for the Spine Patient Outcomes Research Trial, which was a multi-year study that looked at three of the most common back conditions and compared both surgical and non-surgical treatments. And approximately 2,500 patients took part in this study, which was conducted at 13 different sites within the country. So when you looked at these patients who had disc herniations, the great thing to know is that whether a patient got operated on or they didn't, both groups improved substantially, uh, su substantially, whether they did non-operative treatment or they had surgery. But the improvements from standard surgery was a little bit more rapid. And patients who had surgery also reported better results in their physical function and satisfaction one to two years after the operation. With regards to spinal stenosis, patients with spinal stenosis who were treated surgically <clears throat> did show significantly greater improvements in the following compared to those who were treated non-surgically at the one and two year point. So the patients that did surgery did better with regards to their overall pain, function, and disability, meaning they all had less than the patients who were treated non-operatively. They did have increased function. Uh, with regards to spondylolisthesis, patients with spinal stenosis accompanied with a slip or a spondylolisthesis who were then treated surgically did show substantially greater improvements in pain and function through two years follow-up compared to patients treated non-surgically. So we're trying to just try to put all this together. I did go over a bunch of different information uh, uh, with everyone today. So the way to kind of break this down may be to say, a patient comes in with back pain. Well, you want to ask them how long has it been going on? You want to know if it's an acute problem or a chronic problem. Again, remember, chronic is greater than three months for our purposes. But then you want to say, do you have any associated leg or buttock discomfort? This could be worse with walking or standing. And if that's the case, you may want to assess for spinal stenosis. Or is it worse with sitting or straightening their legs, in which you may want to be assessing them for a disc herniation? Now, these are just general, um, general guidelines. Patients can present in either which way with these diagnoses. Then, additionally, you want to know the breakdown of their leg and buttock pain versus just their back pain. You would treat a patient who has 100% low back pain and zero leg pain very differently 
then you would treat someone with 100% leg pain and almost no back pain. So that's very important to know and discuss with your patients with regards to what their expectations should be. And lastly, you want to assess for those red flag symptoms that we were talking about earlier, such as bowel or bladder incontinence, at which point I would suggest sending the patient to an ER for an emergent uh, MRI without contrast. So keep putting it all together with regards to imaging if these patients come in. X-ray, AP, and lateral, standing is important, is a good first line to rule out all major abnormalities. And then you can move on to an MRI without contrast, only if you fail conservative measures for greater than six weeks or if their symptoms are worsening before that time period. There is no benefit for an MRI in patients with chronic low back pain or in patients who have like a few days of, of severe pain without any of those red flag symptoms. Conservative measures normally go by just plain reassurance because the vast majority of these will get better with time. A home exercise program and physical therapy can be added in later as well as anti-inflammatory medication. You can also add a Medrol dose pack if their leg symptoms are present, which can help kind of put out the fire, which may be causing a lot of their pain that's going down their leg if they have a disc issue compressing upon a nerve. And then I like to follow them back up in four to six weeks just to keep a close eye on them. And then when should I refer to a specialist? And the important thing to know is you should refer to a specialist anytime you want. Um, all of our surgeons at uh, Florida Orthopedic Institute are well versed in uh, conservative care and that is one of our mantras is that we use surgery as a very last resort. And in addition, we also have other providers who can continue to provide non-operative management in the form of epidural steroid injections or chiropractic care. But again, another thing to realize is the more leg pain a patient has compared to their back pain is directly proportional to how well they, were, they will do following surgery. Thank you very much for your time.